Hello and welcome to my video on the neural mechanisms of eating behaviour. Um, this will carry on if you're studying the PSYA3 um, spec, carry on from what you should hopefully have looked at in terms of eating behaviour. Um, that would have been kind of uh, psychological explanations, I guess, looking at uh, influences affecting attitudes to food. Um, kind of mood and, and culture, social learning, uh, as well as the success and failure of dieting. So this looks at the biological explanations um, and looks at well what's going on in the brain when it comes to, to eating behaviour. This video will also be relevant to those of you that are starting the year two course from September 2016 uh, and we'll go towards the paper three topic of, of eating. Uh, this will also have relevant content for that. Um, so, looking at this then, um, what we're looking at here is saying, well, eating, it can't just be a psychological thing, it can't just be the environment, it's such an important part of life, obviously without eating you, you're going to die, uh, and so there, are, there have to be biological um, mechanisms in place to ensure that you're going to eat uh, and going to survive, and that's basically uh, the, the starting point of the, the biological explanation. We, as I said, we're going to focus on the neural explanation, so we're going to look at what's going on in, in the brain and kind of neurochemicals and uh, neurotransmitters, hormones, etc., um, to, to what could influence our, our eating behaviour. The first point to start at is the idea of homeostasis. Now, hopefully you've come across this already with your GCSE um, biology, um, but homeostasis is the idea that the, the body wants to maintain a, a level playing field. Um, you know, if you're too cold, you shiver, so you become warmer. If you're too hot, you're, you sweat, so you cool down. Um, and actually, the same idea can be put towards uh, eating behaviour. The idea of homeostasis is, as it says there, it detects and corrects, so it checks um, are, are you right are you hot or cold or are you hungry or not uh, and then it corrects it does something about that so obviously with eating behavior it's checking to see whether your internal environment so basically your body do you have the nutrients do you have the energy that you need and if not what are you going to do about that um, and the idea is then, well, this is this is what hunger and feeling full is. So if you don't, if you do feel hungry, if you don't have the nutrients that you need, um, the body will need to do something about that. It's going to need to turn on eating. Uh, and then when you do ha have enough or, or you feel maybe you're having too much, it's going to need to turn that off. And that's, that's the feeling you feel when you're hungry or when you're too full, um, like going for an all-you-can-eat challenge. Um... The first thing that is going to have a role to play in that is glucose, um, and glucose is said to be kind of the the um, catalyst, the, the motivator in the body for homeostasis, so feeling full or feeling hungry. Um, the idea is that as glucose, and glucose is kind of blood sugar, so if you've got low blood sugar, obviously you're then going to be hungry, so low glucose levels, decreased glucose levels, increases hunger. And if you've got high glucose levels, that then decreases hunger. Um, and so that's the, the idea that we kind of start from. Um, there are specific areas in the brain that are designed to detect glucose uh, or not. So low glucose levels activate something known as the lateral hypothalamus. So lateral hypothalamus. As it's this is a, a biological explanation, there are going to be lots of new kind of terms here. I've got a list of key terms at the end. Um, that you should know. The terms themselves sound big and scary, but actually they're, they're very straightforward once you kind of understand them. So yeah, there's this term, a lateral hypothalamus, but all you need to kind of know is that when that's activated, that that's, turns on the hunger drive. That's the feeling that you get um, before you go for a cheeky Nando's. Once you've eaten, um, that's when glucose level rises, and actually that activates a different system in the brain. So that's the ventral medial hypothalamus. Again, very complex kind of sounding term, but actually it's very straightforward. It's basically the off switch um, and that leads to um, cetacean, which is, is feeling full, being satisfied. So this chart here demonstrates just what I was talking about there. Um, if you look, the blue line is hunger and the red line is blood glucose. So what you find is when you have low 
blood glucose levels, that's when hunger is at its highest. Um, the yellow bar here is eating, so obviously you're eating. As you're eating, the blood glucose levels are increasing, um, and that's at the same rate that the hunger levels are decreasing. So you've got this direct link here between glucose um, and hunger, and feeling full obviously, and as well the lateral hypothalamus and ventromedial hypothalamus. Now, to be sure that each of those areas does have a role to play in eating, we need to look in a bit more detail and look at uh, some research that's been done, uh, which luckily for us, there has. So first of all, looking at the lateral hypothalamus then. So again, this is meant to be uh, the on switch to eating. So when the lateral hypothalamus is activated with low uh, glucose levels, uh, that's when eating commences, where, where, when we're signaled to eat, that, that hunger feeling that you feel. Um, how do we know this? Well, there are several ways, lots of kind of animal studies here. First, there's been damage to the lateral hypothalamus, uh, that's what I mean there by LH, uh, in rats. And this causes aphasia, uh, and aphasia is the absence of eating. So obviously if they're on switch, their lateral hypothalamus is damaged, uh, they don't turn on the eating, and so they, they stop eating as much, uh, and they're a lot more hungry. Um, and what you find also is the reverse effect. So when you stimulate the lateral hypothalamus in rats, this elicits eating behavior. Elicits means causes, so it, it makes them eat. So there's some research there that the lateral hypothalamus does have this role to play in hunger, the, the on switch. Uh, there's also, and this is quite an important thing to know about, um, there's an, uh, a neurotransmitter known as neuropeptide Y. Um, and this is obviously a brain chemical, neurochemical, um, that is thought to again be involved in hungering, in, in starting eating behavior. Um, and what they have found is when neuropeptide Y was injected into the hypothalamus of rats, it caused them to start eating, even when they were sedated, so even when they were full. Um, sediety means uh, you're full, you're, you're satisfied. They were full, they were fine, injected with neuropeptide Y, and this started the eating behavior. That was found by Wickens in 2000. So that, again, adds support to the idea that the lateral hypothalamus is kind of the on switch to eating behavior. Um, as well as this, Stanley et al. Uh, found that they could make some fat rats uh, just by, if they just kept injecting them um, with... Uh, neuropeptide Y, they would just keep eating. So it's almost like this control system that, that's determining whether you eat or not does seem to be very uh, biologically based and you can almost, obviously, in this case, almost tricking it. You, you're you um, kind of encouraging it to work um, even when kind of you shouldn't because you, you're actually full. Um, so lots of support there for the lateral hypothalamus being the kind of on switch to eating. Next, then, we'll look at some support for the idea that the uh, ventral medial hypothalamus has a role to play, a uh, biological role in eating behaviour. Um, as I've already said, this is the off switch to eating. Um, and as you'd expect, you almost find the opposite findings here than you find in the lateral hypothalamus. So as this is the off switch, if there's damage to this area, um, what you find is overeating. Uh, again, this was found in rats, so da rats had damage to their ventral medial hypothalamus and they ended up with uh, a condition called hyperphagia. So you've got aphasia, uh, stopping, uh, hyper, continuing more, so you've got hyperphagia here uh, in rats. And that's what you would expect to find if this was the, the off switch damage the area, you can't stop yourself eating. Uh, and you also find the other finding, which you'd expect to find as well. So if you stimulate this area, if you activate it, it stops the feeding, it inhibits feeding. Um, and so that adds support for the idea that the ventral medial hypothalamus uh, does have this role to play in eating, and specifically um, the off switch. The idea is that in the within the ventral medial hypothalamus, there are receptors, uh, glucose receptors. Um, and so as they receive this glucose, remember the, the increase in glucose stops eating, that's when they say, okay, right, let's switch off uh, the, the eating behavior then. There is some other research here, actually not necessarily contradictory, but it's, I guess, further research that there's a, actually a very specific area of the ventral medial hypothalamus that uh, is related to um, cessation of eating, uh, and that's the paraventricular nucleus. Um, this was discovered by Gold, 
Um, and what they found was actually it was a, a very specific area, this paraventricular nucleus, um, and it was damage to that area that caused hyperphagia, caused um, overeating. And so actually it's, the idea is here that the paraventricular nucleus specifically has a key role to play um, in, the, in the off switch to eating. Um, other support for that comes from the idea that the paraventricular nucleus also detects specific areas that the body needs and so it, it almost instigates your cravings and obviously once you've got those cravings you stop so this is the one where you know where you really 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 want pizza and that seems to be me all the time or when you really want bacon bacon is good for me um that suggests though that or the, the fact that the power and trickling nucleus uh, has a role to play in this um that supports the idea that, that this is the officer which once you've had that craving you then stop the eating Other areas where neural mechanisms have a role to play comes from uh, cognitive factors. So there's the idea that obviously our thinking about food has an interaction with our, our biology and, uh, and areas of the brain. Um, obviously, there, there's a, there is a lot to do in kind of thinking um, involved in food. So thinking about food makes us hungry. So, you know, now if you were to start thinking of a really nice Domino's pizza, or awesome, lovely Nando's, or a, or a takeaway curry. You're probably getting really, really hungry right now. Um, also, kind of images, memory, sight, smells, all of those things. So if you go to a particular restaurant, or you've been to the same place on holiday a couple of times, that might bring back memories of, of food that you've eaten, or, or smells that you've had, and um, all of that kind of has a role to play. Well, there is a neural process underlying that uh, and the two areas that are thought to be involved in those things are the amygdala and the interior frontal cortex. Firstly the amygdala um, works on our past experience so our, our experience of food um, kind of things that we've liked favorite restaurants things like that the, the amygdala has a role to play there. Um, roles and roles uh, have tested this and what they did they removed the amygdala uh, in rats poor rats they're getting a bit of a hard time with this uh, this topic aren't they um, but they removed the, the amygdala in rats and what they found was that these rats would then consume food that they'd never tried before as well as food that they really liked and, and had tried before at the same rate so what that suggests is that the amygdala does have a role to play because actually what you'd expect to find if they had their amygdala, so rats with their amygdala intact would probably or would consume food that they were familiar with and liked a lot more than they would when you presented them with food they didn't know. Um, and that, that could have issues with kind of taste aversion and things like that. We'll look at that in kind of the evolutionary um, approach. But food that they're not familiar with, it could be poisonous. They, they don't know the effect that it's going to have. So they, they would go towards the food that they, they were familiar with. Um, but as their amygdala has been removed, they're, they're eating both food that they know and food that they don't in the same amount. So that suggests that the amygdala has a role to play in selection of food based on past experience. Obviously, this is a rat study, but we would then extrapolate those findings to humans. Uh, the interior frontal cortex is thought to have a role to play in smell. So the interior frontal cortex text is linked to the olfactory bulb and the olfactory bulb is an area in the brain that that links us with smell um, and what they found is that damage in the interior frontal cortex reduces food intake and the reason for this and the link to smell is that actually a lot of what we eat and how we eat and um, our enjoyment for eating comes from smell so if your smell is um, or your, your ability to detect the smells in food is affected um, then your the amount you eat is going to decrease. So the fact that, and this was Kolb and um, Wishaw, that the fact that they found with, with damage to the interior frontal cortex um, decreases eating behaviour, that adds, again, adds weight to the fact that there is this cognitive factor in food. Uh, the thinking, the smells, the memories behind it um, have a role to play. And also, obviously, that there's this neural link between the areas of the brain and our cognition, our thinking, uh, memories and smells, etc. 
Okay, and so the final thing we're going to look at in terms of neural mechanisms of eating is the link between leptin and obesity. Um, so leptin is a chemical thought to decrease eating um, and uh, ensure fat loss. So high levels of leptin um, tend to be um, associated with healthy weight. Um, and obviously low levels of leptin then cause obesity. Um, so again, we're going back to some animal studies here. Um, what happens sometimes is that there are mice that receive two copies of the gene for obesity, um, and it's shortened to OB, and having two copies of that, they're known as OBOB mice. Um, and what these mice do is they, they overeat, um, they always go for foods high in fat and sugar, um, and after testing them, what has been found is that they have defective genes for producing leptin. Um, and so they don't produce enough leptin um, and so that's potentially what's causing them to overeat and become obese. Um, so what Zhang et al. did in 1994 is they found mice with this um, condition um, and what they did is they injected half with uh, leptin and left half to um, develop normally. And what you've got here, so the, this is a picture of uh, two of the mice. Both of these have the OBOB gene. Uh, the one on the left-hand side has been left, um, and then the one on the right-hand side has been injected with leptin. So what this suggests is that this link between uh, leptin and obesity, so uh, high levels of leptin, reduce your chance of having obesity, but if you've got poor uh, leptin production or sensitivity to leptin, that could then increase obesity. There's obviously um, a great link here then to humans, if we can develop um, human trials and, and potentially people who are have a, a predisposition to obesity, um, they could then be injected with leptin uh, and that would then potentially reduce uh, their weight and reduce the obesity. That's still in its infancy at the moment, but it, the trials are happening. Um, but what we can do is we can test people uh, for their leptin production, uh, and if they are uh, not producing enough, then obviously things can be done uh, in the in the meantime, kind of weight and diet and things like that. Um, so that's a, a, a current new area that's kind of uh, up for for research, and potentially in a few years um, there'll be some good discoveries there. Next then, so everything we've done up to now has been AO1, so then we're going to go back through each of these things, the, the lateral hypothalamus, the ventral medial hypothalamus, uh, cognitive control uh, and leptin, and we're going to look at um, some support or weaknesses of these theories in our evaluation. Okay, to start evaluations then we'll go back through uh, the the theories of neural control in eating behaviour. So we started off with homeostasis um, and saying that homeostasis would account for why we feel hungry and then um, when we feel full um, and, and that made a bit of sense. This first evaluative point suggests that actually well, well homeostasis might not be um, the most accurate explanation for the neural control of eating behaviour. The reason for this is that actually well if we link this back almost to evolutionary times, actually homeostasis probably wouldn't be adaptive. If you wait until you're hungry, and obviously suggesting that you're hungry suggests that you're low in nutrients, you're low in all of the good stuff that's going to um, allow you to keep your energy levels up, that's a bad thing. And actually if it was evolutionary Adap evolutionary adaptive and advantageous, then actually our levels of um, food and nutrients, etc., would be kept at uh, an average above what we would need necessarily, um, because actually if it dips below, then that causes you issues. Again, we're going to look at the, the evolutionary view of eating behavior um, in the next video, but actually it's not you're not in a good place if you're low on nutrients, because actually that then inhibits your ability to uh, hunt and gather and get more food, and you, you could end up in real danger. So this first AO2 point or AO3 point, a value point, suggests that actually the, the homeostasis view um, isn't necessarily the most accurate because um, it wouldn't have allowed us this adaptive advan advantage.
The second evaluative point kind of goes as a weakness, goes against as a limitation of the lateral hypothalamus. Um, if you remember, the lateral hypothalamus is meant to be the on switch of eating behavior. That's what the, the theory says, the AO1. Um, and the, the question here, the, the, the discussion point is that, well, actually, the lateral hypothalamus isn't just to do with eating. Uh, it has uh, effects on lots of other things, such as um, sex drive, such as uh, drinking as well as eating. Um, and so, actually, what has been found is that there are many things that influence our eating behavior, turning on and turning off eating, or obviously in this case, turning on eating for the lateral hypothalamus. And actually, there's lots of circuits that run through the brain that, that have a role to play. And so it might be a bit um, a bit too, I don't know, reductionist. It might be too specific to say, oh, it's just the lateral hypothalamus that causes eating behavior. There are lots of other parts to it. Um, and Sakura et al. suggested that the lateral hypothalamus isn't this on switch isn't this eating center uh, that has been suggested that there, there's a lot more to it um, following on from that we're going to look at the role of neuropeptide Y uh, MPY again that that was mentioned when we we're talking about the lateral hypothalamus um, neurotransmitter that um, is responsible for kind of eating behavior um, and Maria Tell suggested that well maybe neuropeptide Y that they question the role in kind of eating behavior. So what happened here? They genetically manipulated mice so they didn't make NPY, um, so that they they weren't producing it. Um, and what they found is that that didn't seem to have an effect on eating behavior. And that's a weird finding because remember in the in the research that we looked at for the AO1, um, when you injected rats and mice with um, MPY, neuropeptide Y, that increased their eating behavior. Uh, but they didn't find that when they, they, they almost naturally bred uh, a lower level of neuropeptide Y into the mice. The explanation for these findings was that, well, actually, maybe these findings that they found um, in the lab when they were injecting neuropeptide, may, neuropeptide Y, maybe that is just, it's too artificial. They, they, they suggested it was an artifact of the research rather than actually um, being found in real life. And so the fact that this it wasn't um, artificial, this study here, suggests that, well, in real life, does neuropeptide Y have such an effect? Um, and actually maybe other areas have a, have a role to play as well. So it kind of questions the role of neuropeptide Y. However, in support, so, you know, it's, it's never cut and dry, it's never black and white saying, yeah, this is correct, and, or, or no, it's not. There is some real-world support and real-world application um, for looking at MPY um, and its relation to kind of eating and eating behavior. Yang et al. Um, found that, so remember we said that um, neuropeptide Y is released and this causes feeding behavior. Well, what Yang et al. have found that is that NPY is actually produced by fat cells. So what you get is neuropeptide Y being released. It starts the eating behavior. So eating more food. We have a preference to kind of fatty, um, sweet, sugary food. Again, we'll look at that in the, in the evolutionary perspective as to why that might be. So we're getting these extra fat cells and then the fat cells are producing NPY again. And so you end up with this vicious cycle. You end up with MPY being produced, which then in turn produces more MPY, and that's just going to go round and round. And so what Yang et al. has said is that this could actually explain obesity and overeating, um, because there's this vicious cycle. And what they suggested is that, well, if this is the case, then actually to target people and to help people with obesity, um, we could almost target drugs that turn off or limit the effect of MPY. Um, and so that's a real world application. So you've got a, a bit of a balance there um, that there were, were some weaknesses, um, but also you've got some real world application. That obviously, application could be used as IDA as well. Um, and so that's from Yang et al. 
Okay, so continuing with the evaluation then, uh, we'll look at the ventral medial hypothalamus. And actually, we've already really looked at the main evaluation of this theory. Remember, the ventral medial hypothalamus was meant to be the off switch uh, to eating. Uh, and the, the bit of research we looked at before was by Gold, who said that, well, actually, maybe it's not just the whole ventral medial hypothalamus, but maybe the paraventricular nucleus was the, the key here. So that kind of goes... It's a weakness, I guess, saying it's just the ventral medial hypothalamus because there are other areas that are involved in this. As a bit of an addition then, just to give you something a bit extra for your evaluation, um, Gold's research hasn't been replicated. So there's still a question as to whether the ventral medial hypothalamus is this uh, has that direct link to eating or not um, with, with the reduction of eating. Um, and what they found was that animals um, that gained substantially more weight with ventral medial hypothalamus um, lesions, so, so damage to the ventral medial hypothalamus, rather than other areas. So there is, uh, it, is it is still up for debate, and there, there is still some support for the idea that it, the ventral medial hypothalamus does um, have a role to play in, in turning off eating. Because again, if they, if they didn't turn off the eating, that's going to cause you to gain weight, isn't it? Okay, looking then at, remember we looked at the fact that there could be neural factors, uh, sorry, neural control of cognitive factors. Well, is that the case? Um, there's a quite an interesting, unfortunate for the people that have got it, uh, condition known as kluver boise syndrome. Um, and what this, what happens here, it people generally get this due to, um, well, it affects their amygdala and their interior prefrontal cortex. And as you remember, we looked at those areas being linked to uh, cognitive factors, influence and in eating. Um, and you generally get these through kind of accidents or, or tumours. Um, and what you find is that there's a variety of unfortunate um, symptoms with this, but particularly related to eating, you find an increased appetite um, you find indiscriminate eating, so what that means is they'll eat things that they know and like as well as things that they don't like, but the, the strange thing is um, eating non-food items. So people, with, people who don't have uh, an intact amygdala and interior prefrontal cortex, as we said, they, these things already affect um, food choice and uh, factors, they then eat things that aren't food. You know, they might eat grass or keys or inanimate objects. Yeah, but quite strange, quite unfortunate. But that actually um, supports the idea that cognitive factors do have a role to play, and specifically the amygdala and interior prefrontal cortex. Um, and the idea here is that they're, they're not getting the the value, the, the the cues from the food. They um, they're not linking what the food is or non-food as the case may be to its value obviously a key isn't going to give you much uh, nutrients um, so that kind of supports the idea of cognitive factors and this link between neural control um, Zaud and Pardo also um, supported this and they found increased blood flow in the amygdala when uh, people are given an unpleasant smell so remember we said the amygdala was linked to kind of food preference uh, well this supports the idea that actually there's preference foods we like food we don't well the amygdala was involved when they they smelt food they didn't like so they might be remembering that that smell uh, and supports this link of emotion and, and food eating the final thing we're going to look at, I and mean, you can use this in an evaluation, uh, is ghrelin. And ghrelin is a hormone rather than a neurochemical. So what this is saying is, well, there, there, there could be lots of neural factors. It's not just the ones we, we, we've looked at that have a role to play in eating. Um, and what ghrelin does, it's released when we are stressed. Um, and what it does, it reduces stress. Um, but an after effect of that is that it boosts appetite and boosts eating. So this is kind of the stress eating thing. This is where people turn to food um, to kind of get over um, being stressed and anxiety causing situations. So th this was suggested by Lutter et al. Um, 
And so again, you, you can kind of link this to real world applications. Well, if this is the case, uh, and we've got people who are obese due to comfort eating, or maybe we could, um, there could be some impact there and some drugs and, and therapy related to ghrelin and blocking ghrelin. Um, but the issue with that would be that actually ghrelin is a, a naturally produced hormone uh, and it's a defense mechanism. And actually, if you start then blocking that, um, you could have a, uh, you know, you're, you're stopping your body's natural defense to stress. Uh, and so that could be a bit of an issue. OK, so that's pretty much all the new information, all the evaluation uh, that you need. Um, and hopefully you can see how you could put that into a 24 mark question if you were to get it for PSYA 3 or, or a 16 marker um, for the new specification paper 3. Um, what I've got here, as I said, there, there are lots of new words and terms. Actually, they sound quite scary, but hopefully I've explained them in simple enough terms that, that they become a bit more manageable. But it might be worth you kind of making a list um, and getting some definitions of these terms. These are kind of the ones that I picked out as being new, but you can also add things to that. Uh, and that might be a, a good task to do. So if you pause the video here um, and make a list of these these. Uh, words that would be a really good thing to do um, and that's it from me for this video um, as usual uh, lots of my information came from the Mike Cardwell and Cara Flanagan book uh, and some of my information came from resource so thank you to that community um, and the next video will be on evolution okay thank you don't forget to subscribe cheers bye